Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you very much for having us here uh, for the wonderful exhibition and uh, for um, the welcome that you've given us, and especially, again, Zainab for managing the logistics so flawlessly. Um, so I'm going to be speaking today about the relation between sight and sound in early Qurans. In other words, about the way in which manuscripts that we tend to treat as a flat surface were in fact, first of all, living objects set within space and also with a dimension of orality. As objects, they were perceived through sight, but they also mediated the reception of the Quran through hearing, an experience which had a profound aesthetic dimension. And I'm going to use primarily uh, the Great Mosque of Damascus, built between 706 and 715, to illustrate my points about space. Uh, this choice is convenient for several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the Turkish and Islamic Art Museum uh, has got 210,000 folios that come from the Mosque of Damascus, so it is very topical. Second, as uh, Masume uh, mentioned, I'm, I'm writing a book about it, so I'm a bit biased there. Uh, but third, its uh, period marks a turning point in the articulation of the trends that I'm going speaking about and trying to articulate. So let me start first from the elements that have been studied so far uh, in, in themes relevant to me today by modern scholarship, Korans and mosques. So when we look at mosques, uh, we study the buildings for their structure. We, for the early period of Islam, we try to distinguish different layers of building. We study the wonderful surface ornament, and then we usually turn to question of patronage and the message that's being conveyed to the population by the patron. When we look at Qur'ans, uh, we analyze the calligraphy first and then the illumination. Uh, we study, especially in early Islam, again, layout and proportions. And more recently, uh, people have been getting more interested in the study of orthography in early Qur'ans. And as you start uh, looking at the orthography, which is the red dots that you can see in this manuscript here, you realize that uh, the common formula of the Ed Memoir, so the uh, Quran manuscript that's there as a support for memory in early Islam, isn't the full story. And we should perhaps use an analogy with a musical partition in the sense of something that gives a very detailed map of how you should recite every inflection of the Quranic text. So studying this brings us already at the threshold of orality. These building blocks, oral, uh, uh, formal analysis and social context, are absolutely essential if we are to reach any meaningful history, and there is still much to learn about them. But so today I'm taking us in a different direction, which is the history of perception. Uh, and this field has been uh, largely pioneered uh, by Alain Corbin uh, in France, um, uh, whose studies are about 19th century France, and especially about smell and sound. This is an inherently elusive field, and so the ideas I'm presenting today are still exploratory. Now, our own culture is a culture of the image, and so we have a natural tendency to emphasize this dimension of the Quranic text. But in early Islamic culture, things were different. Like many late antique and medieval cultures, and perhaps even more so than most, early Islamic culture was profoundly steeped in orality. And this value naturally applied to the Quran. As all of you know, uh, the Quran was originally received, according to Muslim tradition, as a revelation that started with the injunction, recite, recite in the name of thy Lord. And in the same uh, surah, surah 96, we already have a mention of the pen as well. So the Quran is sent down through 
the soul of the prophet, and then the prophet transmits, transmits it orally to his companions. Although this enigmatic mention of the pen in Surah 96 already adds a first layer of complexity to this question. And we have other verses that affirm this fundamentally oral nature of the text. I'll just cite one. We have sent thee a Quran, we have divided for thee to recite it to mankind at intervals, and we have sent it down successively. In other words, according to Muslim tradition, if the Quran was initially committed to human memory, it wasn't only because the Arabs didn't have an evolved culture of the book yet, but it was also a part of its very design. As Navid Kermani perceptively put it in his uh, very insightful and uh, stimulating book about um, uh, uh, aesthetics in the Quran, from the moment God had Gabriel recite the revelation to the prophet, each successive actualization of the Quran is produced by humans. Yet this is not seen as a shortcoming, but as the revelation's essence of sending down, as an event which joins the divine with the human. In other words, Kermani convincingly argues that the Quran is not just heard as a text during recitation, but that, in a sense, the revelation is actualized or is brought to the present time through the mouth of the reciter. It brings down grace. Now, if this is difficult to context, con uh, contextualize, uh, conceptualize, uh, you could try to compare it with uh, the Eucharist in Christianity. There is a similar idea going on here. So the implication is that there is a certain primacy, at least in theory, of orality over the codex. And we see this asserted quite forcefully in sayings attributed to companions of the prophet in the ninth century, in Ibn Abi Dawood's Kitab al-Masahif. So uh, the most, its most beautiful ornament, that is the Quran, is its correct recitation. And this is ascribed to one Abdullah, so one of the companions of the prophet. And about the Quran, which had silver and gold, you will tempt thieves with it. Its beauty lies within. This means that by that period, the ninth century, a tension was felt in some religious circles, perhaps most, between the primacy of orality in the Quran and its materiality, especially when it became luxurious. So, Let's try to retrace the roots of this development. With the death of the prophet and then of his companions, the risk emerged of losing part of the sacred text or of seeing different versions enter into circulation. And as you all know, it is at that stage that uh, the Caliph Uthman, the third Caliph who died in 655, would have issued a canonical recension of the Quran. Once the, this collection was complete, Uthman would have sent uh, copies as manuscripts to the major cities of the nascent empire of Islam, such as Kufa, Basra, and Damascus. And these would constitute the basis of the variant readings which were known in later centuries and um, associated with each of these cities. What we know from the material record is that in the following deca decades, manuscripts acquire increasing importance in the transmission of the Quran, something that Professor Desroches has studied extensively. But we must remember as well that in parallel with the manuscripts, men were also settling down in these cities, and women as well, for instance, Umm Darda uh, at Damascus. And it was through them that the contents of the books could be validated through oral transmission. 
According to Ibn Sa'd, who died in 845, an office of the Quran reciters, in Qurra, was created by Omar, the second caliph, so before uh, Uthman's uh, recension had been undertaken. So we have in Islamic tradition much emphasis on this world of the readers more than of the copists. And we have uh, contemporary evidence from Umayyad court poetry, which will be in my book on Damascus, uh, that reciters were active at the mosque of Damascus in the seventh century, uh, before the current building was built. And at that time, uh, there was a church still on the site, which uh, sat right next to the first mosque. And interestingly, in these poems, the tension that's built up about, about this coexistence within this space at the heart of the Islamic empire is described in terms not of conflicting dogmas, but of conflicting sounds, of the sound of the reader that gets mixed up in a cacophony with uh, the sound of uh, the clapping, clapping bells of the Christians. So until about the end of the seventh century, I think we can imagine as a general scheme, relatively frugal mosques with Kufa and possibly the Aqsa as possible exceptions from the 670s onwards, and recitation performed by memory within their space with rare manuscripts of the Quran, there weren't very many in existence at the time, that served as a reference point to fix the text, but as far as we can tell, weren't used for display or for recitation. Certainly not for recitation, and you'll see why in a minute. Now, the turn of the 8th century marks a turning point with regard to this situation on several levels. First, Omeyyad architectural patronage gives Muslim monuments an unprecedented degree of sophistication, notably through the establishment of a new template. And here I'm showing the Dome of the Rock, even though it's not a mosque, because it's the earliest example, dated 692, uh, on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So it's a template that's inspired by Christian architecture, but reworked, and it involves Roman columns with their capitals, usually Corinthian, arches rather than flat architraves, and most obviously mosaic ornaments that you can see at the top here, and marble dados. Second, in parallel with this, the Omeyyads sponsor the production of monumental Quran manuscripts, and these have a reformed script by comparison with the Hijazi script that you've just seen a minute ago, and principles of geometry and proportion are applied to the script. And at the same time, the Omeyyads introduce architectural illumination in their Qurans. And this is uh, the famous uh, Quran with full architectural illumination that was discovered in uh, Sana'a uh, 40 years ago, but that is probably from Syria. Third, according to the sources, there was also a reform of Quranic orthography at this stage, uh, through which uh, vocalization through red dots was introduced. This is compatible with what we know so far about early Qurans, but it's still requires to be studied more critically in full. But it fits the general pattern of what we see in the manuscripts. According to Malik ibn Anas, the famous 8th century Medinan uh, jurist, it was al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, the powerful governor of Iraq and the eastern provinces, who died in 715, who first introduced the practice of reading from Qurans in mosques. So, uh, and this is recorded by a very early source, Ibn Zabala, uh, late 8th century. So, the Quran enters the mosque as an object at the same time that the mosque is being monumentalized. And there is, 
at this point in time, a new orchestration of Muslim ritual. And we know from other sources that uh, Qurans were taken out from the palace, which was adjacent to the mosque, to the Qibla area, on Thursday evening for dua and on Friday for prayer. The recitation of verses from the Quran inside the mosque would be followed five times a day by the call to prayer. According to a late Syrian source, Abu al-Baqa, early 15th century, the Caliph al-Walid, who built the great mosque of Damascus, and I cite, had attached to it three companies of muezzins, so people who uh, uh, performed the call to prayer, who would take shifts there with 40 mu muezzins in each company. I'm going to leave aside for now uh, the question of source criticism um, and focus on the key fact, which is that in major mosques, multiple muezzins must, must have called to prayer and that their common utterance was meant to spread across the city or the town and that it reverberated through the city since individuals were meant to repeat it when they heard it with small variations of uh, phrasing before going to perform their prayer at work, at home, or in the mosque. And so you can imagine them perhaps spread across the walls of the great mosque of Damascus um, in that period. So the call to prayer marks out the unity of urban space again through sound. And there is this relationship between space and sound. And at a more fundamental level, it marks time. But this is a time that was more qualitative than quantitative, to use a distinction drawn out by Christ Christophe Pomian and Alain Corbin. The turning point for this being relatively recent, uh, the invention and diffusion of the modern mechanical clock, which breaks down time into a uh, regular continuum. So while our perception today is of a time that relentlessly moves forward, the mosque, like church bells as well, articulates a more cyclical time, a, a time uh, that creates a rhythm around key moments but the interval in between in which our lives unfold is more elastic. And maybe this is how people manage to spend so much time producing the wonderful manuscripts that we've seen since yesterday. I think would be incapable of doing that. So the call to prayer expands outwards and provides an impulse to city life. And just as importantly, to return to my previous point, the sound of the Quran animates the space of mosques. The scheme of Omeyyad mosques, which I've just outlined, featured Qur'ans produced by the Omeyyads. And I'm going to show this one again, which you've seen already with Professor Desroches uh, yesterday. And uh, as was already mentioned, it's probably a bit later, second half of the 8th century. But the Omeyyads also produce monumental Qur'ans, which are a bit smaller than this. Maybe I would cut the page somewhere about here, and you have an Umayyad Qur'an. So this is a real physical presence within the architecture. And there is a game of mirrors, which goes on here. The script of the book is echoed in monumental inscriptions, and the architectural illuminations mirror both the actual architecture of the mosque and the decorative motifs which are represented in mosaic. So in a sense, you could say that the manuscript represents the gem housed within the magnificent casing of this new architecture, um, for it encapsulates its whole raison d'etre, which is the Quran. And here I can't uh, resist citing uh, hadith, even though, again, we have a problem of source criticism. It's by uh, At-Tirmidhi, so one of the uh, uh, canonical 9th century hadith compilers. The prophet would have said, he who doesn't have within him something of the Quran is like a house in ruin. So this applies to the person and to the person of the reciter, but you can also expand it to the building. 
These Umayyad buildings had major inscriptions. We still have the one of, at the Dome of the Rock. There was a very long one also in mosaic at the Mosque of Damascus, and an even longer one at the Prophet's Mosque in Medina, which was rebuilt during the same decade. And in this um, context, uh, these inscriptions must have evoked a reaction that was not only visual, but also oral, in the sense of conjuring the recited text of the Quran. And so the space of the mosque was animated at the moment of recitation. And here I'm showing you a reconstruction of the structure of the mosque of Damascus uh, in uh, the Umayyad period. This is a draft. Uh, it's a work in progress. And uh, I'm working with an architect. I haven't done this myself, obviously. Uh, the, architect, uh, sorry, the texture will be added later. But the important point for now is that it, it gives you a sense of a very open space where this is the Mosque of Damascus standing at any point in the courtyard. You can see through uh, a forest of columns and you would probably have seen uh, shimmering lights uh, towards the Qibla wall which had precious stones in the Karma studied by Barry Flood and mosaics as well. So recitation in a way uh, unifies this space and gives it a dynamic quality which is also present in the decoration uh, as, lights, as light moves through the day uh, with candlelight at night and also as you walk and the alignments keep on moving. Underlying the experience of sacred space crafted by the Omeyads was a convergence around some key aesthetic values. First, you see structure and proportion um, constantly um, coming back in different forms uh, in architecture. They're a natural part of it. In early Qurans, the Umayyads introduced it there. And we have Quran commentators who marvel at the perfection of its structure. So al Jorjani in the 11th century, says that the miracle of the Quran lies in the way in which the first word of a verse joins with the second, the second with the third, the third with the fourth, and so on. Even though it's late, I'm citing it because this closely echoes the notion of proportion as it existed in antiquity and in early Islam. What we know about uh, the eighth century is that there is certainly a feeling at least of the rhythm of the Quranic text. Second value, ambiguity, polysemy. This is a core value in the Quran, which uh, makes it a fundamentally open text. And it was regarded in classical Islam not as a shortcoming, but as a source of an infinite depth of meaning. And it's alluded to in the text itself. Now, the same ambiguity lies at the heart of Omeyyad art, and particularly, of Omeyyad mosaics. Uh, this is the reason why uh, art historians have been debating uh, their meaning for nearly a century. Because you can coherently argue that this is a vision of paradise or of empire. I would argue that this ambiguity was a consciously crafted value that was meant to enrich the meaning of the mosaics. One of the companions of the Prophet, Ibn Mas'ud, would have said about the Quran, its sweetness is never ending, and its spring never runs dry. Also, when I contemplate the Hamim surahs, that's a group of seven surahs in the Quran, it is as if I had entered evergreen gardens with soft and lovely meadows. I am always searching for them. Here, rivers and meadows are evoked not primarily as a concept conceptual image of paradise, but as the expression of an inner experience. So perhaps rather of touching paradise, so to speak. And it's a similar reaction that we find in a poem by Anabi Rashaybani, one of Al-Walid's court poets. 
which again will be part of uh, that Damascus book. Uh, for him, the ornament of the mosque of Damascus nearly blinds the clear-sighted clear of the nation, Basir al-Qawm, an expression which could evoke both literal uh, dazzlement uh, at uh, uh, the accumulation of decoration, but also a flash of spiritual insight. Polysemy is here again. Thus, beyond conceptual considerations of meaning lay a more experiential or aesthetic dimension of both the Quran and the artistic forms that were developed around it. Thank you.